Here in Illinois, recreational cannabis was enacted in 2019 with more of a whimper than a bang. With no real or organized opposition and a supermajority of Democrats in the House, along with the cannabis-friendly governor, it was all but inevitable. We in law enforcement were told after the elections in 2018, even before any debate or formal legislative consideration of the subject, that the die had been cast. Get ready. It was happening. In view of the sickly opposition, many of the underwhelming arguments in favor of recreational cannabis went unscrutinized and unchallenged. Among the public, the most common refrain was that recreational cannabis was, no big deal, life will go on. After all, many said, alcohol is legal. Well, when one in response points out the staggering social and health costs and misery caused by widespread alcohol use in terms of crime and sickness and death and poverty and family discord and inquires as to whether or not we want more of that in Illinois, or when one points out the fact that we've done just fine as a free constitutional republic here in Illinois for over 200 years, thank you very much, without recreational marijuana, or when one points out that there's a difference between tolerating the use of a substance such as alcohol or nicotine that, while not necessarily promoting the public good, have been commonplace since the inception of the Illinois Republic over 200 years ago, these points are mostly met with a shrug. That shrug, that general indifference that recreational cannabis advocates counted on and spent millions in public relations eliciting. The point of this movie is to discuss recreational cannabis and to analyze the arguments in favor of legalization and to respond to them, laying them bare for what they are, unconvincing. This movie is not intended to be a sequel to Reefer Madness, nor does it maintain that marijuana legalization just moved the Illinois doomsday clock to zero. Rather, the position of this movie is that the purpose of laws should be to effectuate the public good, and that recreational cannabis does the opposite. Now sure, I concede. The fight here in Illinois has been lost. The truth has been buried in favor of ideology. But we still have breath in our lungs here at the state's attorney's office, and we're going to use it. Let's quickly talk about just some basic facts of marijuana. So the Latin name for marijuana is cannabis sativa, and the active ingredient in cannabis sativa is tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC. You've probably all heard of that. That's the chemical compound that's responsible for the high. And THC is hydrophobic. And what that means is that it does not like water one bit. And that's going to become important when we talk about DUIs and cannabis. Now, THC is found in the resin of the leaves and the buds of female plants. And it can be isolated using an alcohol solvent such as ethanol or butane or propanol. And what emerges is the THC crystal, which can then be put in things like food and drinks. Now, marijuana contains not just cannabinoids, not just THC, but also over 500 chemicals, many of which are noxious, including carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, benzene, acetylaldehyde, ammonia, and polycyclic hydrocarbons. Now, if you opened up a textbook on cannabis, here are some of the effects that you'd likely read about. Red eyes, dry mouth, relaxed sense of well-being, heightened senses, changed perception of time, may cause hallucinations, may cause anxiety, impairs reaction time, judgment, and motor coordination, all of which are pretty important for driving. But those textbook descriptions really doesn't give us a sense of what it feels like to be high. So here are some quotes regarding the effects of marijuana that we pulled from the internet. There are an inexhaustible number of these types of quotes. We selected these quotes to highlight some of the problematic aspects of marijuana. First quote. Time will be slower. You will have HD vision, kind of like a dream, but not really, more like you're looking through the lens of a camera. Things will be funnier, munchies, increase heart rate, etc. Some things feel unreal, not like hallucinating, but you know, it feels like my body is one step behind my mind. The second quote, it's like taking the best day of your life and setting it on fire in a glass bowl and inhaling the sweetness from within. Third quote, I feel like there is hope. Fourth quote, it can kind of make you feel like you're locked up in your own thoughts for hours, and the thoughts can be pleasant, paranoia, or unusual thoughts, which make you feel terrified or anxious. So let's just step back and think about these quotes for a second. If marijuana is the one bright spot in an otherwise gloomy and dreary existence, or if marijuana cigarette can recapture the essence of the best sober day of your life, you think cannabis is not subject to abuse? Let's look at the final quote. This is a description of being high by the writer for a men's magazine who sampled some edibles 
from a Colorado dispensary. This is nice. Whole body feels warm and loose, limber. I should stay here in this place. Maybe pet the dog a bit. Just floating on a sea of DGAF, which stands for don't give a fuck. That's a dumb phrase. Why did you type it? Do ships sail on seas of DGAF? What would those ships be named? USS fuck not given? RMS queen fuck it? USS fuckity fucka fuckaroo? I spend five minutes thinking up more ship names. I come up with the great one, the most creative and wittiest thing that has ever left my brain. By the time I get up and walk to the computer, I can't remember what it was. So I eat a half pint of raspberry sorbet and then rummage around in the fridge. Well, here are my questions. Is this guy in that state in a position to be a father? Is this guy in that state in a position to be a husband? Is this the guy you want serving food to you at a restaurant or doing your taxes? Is this the guy you want sitting next to you on a train or a bus? Is this the guy who you want driving you around in an Uber? Many proponents of marijuana have long insisted that marijuana has no health risk. In fact, it has a number of health benefits. In support, some point to the fact that it comes from the earth. Well, so too does cyanide. More sophisticated advocates tout individual studies of the health benefits to prove their point. My dad always told me, be wary of the guy who likes to bowl and be wary of the man pointing to just one study. There are studies out there that purport to show a causal link between vaccines and autism. It doesn't make it true. One study says that coffee is good for you, another that it's bad. One study says that a glass of red wine each evening is good for you, another that it's bad. One study says that taking a low-dose aspirin pill each day is good for you, another that it's bad. All individual studies have limits and blind spots and drawbacks, especially when considering how inputs into the unimaginably complex system that is the human body impact that system. As such, one of the most useful tools when trying to draw scientific conclusions in complex areas of study related to health and medicine is meta-analyses. Now, the scientific definition of a meta-analysis is a quantitative, formal, and epidemiological study used to systematically assess the results of previous research to derive conclusions about that body of research. But more simply put, it synthesizes all prior studies in a particular area and determines what we know from these studies and with how much certainty. Well, it turns out, in 2017, the highly respected National Academy of Sciences, after reviewing over 10,000 studies, did just that with respect to marijuana. And here's what they found. In terms of the medical benefits, the National Academy of Sciences found that there was moderate to substantial evidence to support that it may be effective in the treatment of chronic pain in adults. It may be effective in the treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, and it may be effective in improving short-term sleep outcomes for certain illnesses. With respect to the dangers, the National Academy of Sciences found moderate to substantial evidence to support that it impairs cognitive domains of learning, memory, and attention, and can reduce IQ that it increases the risk of schizophrenia and other forms of psychosis, that it increases the risk for the development of depressive disorders, that it increases the incidence of suicidal ideation and suicide attempts, that it increases the risk of substance abuse dependence and substance abuse disorder of other substances such as alcohol, tobacco, and illicit drugs, that it increases the risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, that it worsens respiratory problems such as bronchitis, that it increases the risk of suffering from social anxiety disorder, that mothers who ingest marijuana while pregnant, it can lower infant birth weight. Nine percent of users become addicted and develop a substance abuse issue, and it's associated with low productivity and job performance. Since the National Academy of Sciences published its meta-analyses in 2017, there's been a number of other subsequent studies that only underscore the dangers of marijuana use. A 2019 study found that marijuana use adversely affects the body's resistance to many infections, compromising the immune response. Another 2019 study found that marijuana use increased the risk for hypertension-associated mortality, platelet aggregation, and thrombosis. Another 2019 study found that marijuana use increases the risk of hypertension, high cholesterol, coronary artery disease, stroke, epilepsy, myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, arrhythmia, The same study found that cannabis use is inversely associated with physical activity levels and chronic use can cause anxiety, depression, and decreased motivation. 
Another 2019 study found that daily cannabis use was associated with a three-fold increase in developing a psychotic disorder compared with non-users. And this risk increases to five times for daily use of high potency types of cannabis. The truth is there is so much we do not know about how marijuana affects physical and mental health of individuals, culture, and society broadly. Many have described marijuana legalization as simply one great experiment which I guess would make all of us and our children the lab rats. Prior to recreational marijuana, Illinois legalized medical cannabis in 2014, which essentially allowed, quote, patients to possess up to two and a half ounces, which is like a lightly packed freezer bag of cannabis. Well, here are the medical conditions that qualify a patient to a, quote, prescription for cannabis as, quote, medicine. Pain management, PTSD, cancer, glaucoma, HIV, AIDS, hepatitis C, ALS, Crohn's, muscular dystrophy, traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's, lupus, spinal cord injury, nail patella syndrome, muscular dystrophy, and the list goes on. The first thing that should jump out at you is that based on the National Academy of Sciences meta-analysis, cannabis has not been proven scientifically effective at treating any of these conditions that qualify for medical cannabis. So what's going on here? Well, there's a concept in politics called Overton's window. The idea of Overton's window is that there is only a set range of ideas that are considered legitimate or worthy of consideration. And those ideas exist in a figurative window. For example, legalizing heroin for recreational use would not currently be within Overton's window. If you want to legitimize your currently illegitimate political policy, you have to move the window. Medical marijuana was largely enacted not because there was a sufficient scientific basis upon which to conclude that it furthered health care or was necessary to treat medical conditions. There wasn't and there isn't. Even if marijuana could be said to treat some of the listed disorders, there is no, zero evidence that marijuana is better, safer, or more effective than other available medical treatments. To this day, the FDA has not approved smoking cannabis as an effective treatment for a single medical disorder. The Illinois legislature here was simply following Colorado's playbook of moving Overton's window, getting the camel's nose under the tent by fostering more broadly social acceptance of cannabis. What was once deemed a dangerous drug was now, quote, medicine. What was once illegal and prohibited is now sanctioned. What was once perceived to be sold in alleys is now sold to, quote, patients at a nice and clean retail establishment next to the Starbucks. At the time of its passage, medical marijuana legislation was openly regarded as merely an attempt to make the paths straight for full legalization. Here's some information on the recreational cannabis law that was passed in Illinois. A couple things that are worth pointing out. First, the taxes. The 7% tax on the marijuana dispensary is, of course, passed on to the consumer. After all, businesses don't pay taxes. They collect taxes from customers. A state excise tax imposed directly on the consumer can be as high as 25%, this on top of a 3.5% local government tax. So depending on the product, consumers could be asked to pay 36% above market value because of taxes. Well, one of the arguments that legalization proponents made was that we should legalize marijuana because millions of Illinois residents are already using it and it's remarkably easy to acquire. Well, if that's true, why would I stop buying from my dealer just so I could buy from a dispensary at a huge markup? More on this later. Second thing to notice is where the money is going. It's not going to schools. 35% of taxes are going to the general fund and 10% to the Illinois Budget Stabilization Fund, which is essentially just a rainy day fund for the state of Illinois. So in other words, 45% is just going straight to the state of Illinois, which has not exactly proven itself to be a responsible steward of tax revenue. 25% is going to the Restoring Our Communities Fund, or R3. The R3 program will provide funding for, in their words, quote, violence prevention, reentry, and health services to areas across the state that are objectively found to be acutely suffering from the horrors of violence bolstered by concentrated disinvestment, end quote. Okay, aside from the word salad used here to describe the program, hopefully it works out. Hopefully there are sufficient guardrails against Illinois corruption that has seen these types of grant funds being misused and converted for decades. What's important to note is that this law does not result in cannabis legalization in a broad sense. 
Rather, think of this more as cannabis commercialization. Only a small subset of corporations licensed by the state are able to sell marijuana, essentially on behalf of the state of Illinois, which holds a monopoly and complete control over who can grow, who can transport, distribute, and dispense. And for the privilege of doing so, for the privilege of working in the recreational cannabis industry, you essentially must pay the state of Illinois one-third of everything that you earn. Cannabis is not, quote-unquote, legal. It's still illegal for residents to grow their own marijuana. It's still illegal for residents to sell any amount of cannabis. It's still illegal for residents to possess over 30 grams of cannabis. It's still illegal for residents to possess marijuana if they're under 21. It's still illegal for residents to use marijuana in public. Further, the misdemeanor and felony laws and penalties for possessing more than 30 grams of marijuana or for selling any amount of marijuana are unchanged. Here is the estimate of the sales and tax revenue from marijuana in 2020. As you can see, it's estimated that Illinois will realize approximately 1. billion in sales, leading to 505 million in tax revenues for the state of Illinois annually. Let's step back and consider this, though, especially in light of many of the claims by cannabis advocates that recreational marijuana will help Illinois with its woeful financial problems. The state of Illinois' financial portfolio is disastrous. Illinois residents are currently on the hook for $250 billion in debt. The state's total assets are approximately $29 billion. Let me say that again. We owe $250 billion. We have about $29 billion on hand. So if Illinois is estimated to bring in $500 million annually through cannabis sales, we could sell marijuana to our citizens for the next 200 years transfer all of these tax proceeds directly to paying off our liabilities, our debt, and we would still not have enough money to pay off the bills we owe right now, today. While COVID-19 certainly has impacted and reduced sales, here's how much marijuana Illinois has sold one third of the way through 2020, a total of 147 million. Now remember, estimates for 2020 were 1.6 billion. Prior to COVID-19, the plan was for 75 dispensary licenses to have been awarded throughout Illinois in 2020. There were 700 applicants, which means that getting awarded a dispensary license is an incredibly competitive process. It's like trying to get into an Ivy League school. If you look at the criteria for being awarded a license, 50 points or 20% of the evaluation rests on whether or not the applicant is a social equity applicant. In other words, you do not have a shot at a license unless you get a high score in the social equity category. What exactly is a social equity candidate? It's a person who lives in a disproportionately impacted area. In other words, basically an impoverished area and or who has been arrested or convicted of a class four felony or misdemeanor cannabis offense. In other words, basically someone who's been arrested or convicted of a low level cannabis offense. Presumably, one scores higher if both criteria apply. So. For those silly, law-abiding people in impoverished areas, you know, those people that followed the law and didn't sell or possess cannabis, they are now not eligible to take part in the lucrative business of cannabis sales. And for everyone else who may not live in a disproportionately impacted area, you need not apply. This map shows you how the state representatives from the General Assembly voted on recreational cannabis. Green districts voted for recreational cannabis and red districts voted against. Recreational cannabis, like many other laws in Illinois, show in vivid contrast the influence Chicagoland politics has on the state of Illinois. In many ways, this isn't fair, as Chicago bears little resemblance in terms of way of life and oftentimes values to downstate Illinois. Yet from a legislative standpoint, time after time, the problems and challenges facing Chicago are imputed onto the rest of the state. Time after time, there is this irresistible urge of Chicago lawmakers to impose statewide Chicago-style, quote, reforms onto the rest of the state to solve problems unique to Chicago. And because of the population imbalance, downstate Illinois residents are powerless to stop these laws. In addition, the cannabis industry, which is a sophisticated and well-funded special interest group, was very active in Illinois, ensuring that it had the votes to get recreational cannabis passed. But apparently, Kelly Cassidy, one of the bill's sponsors in the House, doesn't, quote, pay attention, end quote, to campaign contributions. Interesting, then, that the smart and strategic people in big cannabis decided just to throw their money away. 
But yes, of course, I'm sure Kelly Cassidy doesn't pay any mind or any attention to campaign contributions in the same way a scuba diver doesn't pay any attention to oxygen still left in her tank. What an outrageously disingenuous statement in response to the legitimate inquiry into how the special interest cannabis industry is influencing and dictating laws in this country. Let's turn now and respond to some of the arguments that recreational marijuana proponents have put forward to support recreational marijuana. First, many posit that recreational cannabis is merely a question of freedom, self-determination. If someone wants to use marijuana, it's their business. They argue further that, look, large swaths of the Illinois population are already exercising their freedom and using marijuana. So why not just regulate and tax it? But of course, you can drive a truck through that logic. If you accept this argument, what is the principal distinction one would make as to why they would not then also advocate for recreational heroin, or recreational cocaine, or recreational fentanyl, recreational LSD, recreational ecstasy, or recreational methamphetamine? They come at this idea of freedom, first of all, with just a twisted sense of what the word means. Freedom is not the ability to do whatever feels good. Taking drugs does not enhance a man or a woman's quote-unquote freedom. It impairs it by circumscribing the range of his interests and impairing his ability to pursue more important human aims, such as raising a family, furthering a professional career, donating time to charity, or fulfilling civic obligations. Far from being expanders of consciousness, marijuana limits it. The most striking feature of the marijuana user is the journey into inner space, this tedious self-absorption and fixation on how that person feels. A man whose appetite is his law or a man who needs little doses of THC in his bloodstream each and every day strikes me as more enslaved than free. And as for the idea that a lot of people are already doing it, the purpose of drug laws is not to eradicate their use entirely, but to limit and reduce the number of people from engaging in an activity that does not promote the common good, is dangerous to the user, think about seatbelt laws, and necessarily affects others who occupy the same family, community, workspace, whatever, as the user. Simply because there are a lot of people already using cannabis illegally in Illinois is irrelevant. A lot of people are currently driving under the influence of alcohol, committing retail thefts, and running stop signs. That doesn't mean we should make any of those things legal. Well, cannabis advocates pivot, it's not just about freedom. No, 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 no. It's also about social justice. Recreational marijuana is necessary, they continue, because marijuana criminalization disproportionately affects blacks and Hispanic people and impoverished neighborhoods, and the war on drugs has contributed to mass incarceration and predatory policing. Well, I respond thusly. If marijuana criminalization disproportionately affected the impoverished or black and Hispanic communities, then so too will recreational marijuana. In the state of Washington, since legalization, the prevalence of cannabis use increases as levels of education and income decrease. It is well established that minorities and the impoverished have the highest levels of cannabis use disorder in the country. And now we've unleashed recreational cannabis which is bolstered by the awesome forces of capitalism that seek only to increase revenues by increasing the number of people using, by increasing the frequency in which they use, and by increasing the amount that they use. Who do you think they're going to target with their marketing? Who do cigarette companies still target to this day? This is exactly what led Reverend Gregory Seal Livingston of Chicago, former Illinois chairman of the National Action Network and chief of field operations for the Rainbow Push Coalition to decry that recreational cannabis advocates are, quote, pimping blacks and Hispanics, end quote. Dr. Sally Satel, a psychiatrist and Yale Medical School lecturer observed, it's ironic that the people lobbying for liberalized marijuana access do not appear to be the group that is consuming the bulk of it. Instead, she continues, quote, it is the daily and near daily users who are less educated, less affluent, and less in control of their use. As for recreational cannabis having any capacity to reduce the prison population in Illinois, this is bunk. In 2019, only 450, or approximately 1% of the inmates in the Illinois Department of Corrections were there for a cannabis-related offense. And I can assure you that none of them were in prison for possessing 30 grams or less of cannabis. They were there because they were trafficking in large quantities and were convicted of serious felony offenses that are still on the books in Illinois today. Look at the Colorado and Washington prison populations. Now, Colorado and Washington, which are the earliest states to enact recreational cannabis laws in 2013, give us some of our best data on what types of consequences we can expect to see in Illinois. 
The prison populations in these states have not decreased since 2013, and the official projections have their respective prison populations increasing substantially in the future. In addition to the prison argument, however, advocates also argue that recreational cannabis is needed because minorities are disproportionately charged with minor cannabis violations. Often it's contended that police use cannabis laws to target minorities and as a pretext to harass them or to stop and to search them. Well, if that's the concern, decriminalization, not recreational cannabis, is the answer. In 2016, Governor Rauner decriminalized possession of small amounts of cannabis. In particular, Governor Rauner made the possession of less than 10 grams of cannabis akin to a traffic ticket. So in 2011, prior to Governor Rauner's decriminalization, the police in Cook County made 21,000 arrests for misdemeanor marijuana possession. In 2017, after decriminalization, that number dwindled to only 129. In other words, your chance of getting arrested for a misdemeanor cannabis offense was 0.006%, which is about five times less than getting struck by lightning during one's lifetime. If the point is that perhaps our criminal response to cannabis has been disproportionate with the harm that it causes, or in other words, that we are over-punishing, that's a fair conversation. The answer to that concern, however, isn't to pretend that cannabis is not harmful, nor is the answer recreationalizing it. The answer is decriminalization and aligning penalties more appropriately with the harm caused. In addition, if our laws are being enforced in an unbalanced manner that is suggestive of racial bias, the solution to that is to reform the manner in which we enforce our laws, not repeal the laws themselves. Far from reducing drug arrests, recreational cannabis in Colorado has resulted in more drug arrests. In addition, recreational cannabis in Colorado has done nothing to further social justice and policing. Blacks in Colorado are still getting arrested at twice the rate of whites for drug offenses. While it's true that marijuana arrests in Colorado decreased 47 percent between 2012 and 2017, this was due to the fact that far less people were arrested for minor possession-related offenses. The number of felony marijuana cases, which usually involve distribution in larger amounts, have not decreased despite legalization. In addition, the number of illegal cannabis seized by authorities increased from around 5,000 pounds in 2012 to over 17,000 pounds in 2017. A similar trend with respect to drug offenses is also observed in Washington. But look at violent crime in Washington. It's increased significantly since 2014. Look at property crime in Washington. It has also increased after legalization, peaking in 2017. Now consider violent crime in Colorado. Violent crime has increased 25%, which in the criminal justice world is an enormous figure. So what's going on here? We were told that recreational marijuana will reduce crime because there will be less arrests and we were going to be putting violent drug traffickers and dealers out of business. That doesn't appear to be the case. At the outset, it's important to note that there's no one-to-one -one simple relationship between marijuana legalization and crime. Crime statistics are influenced by a myriad of social and political factors. And just because crime rises after a specific state-sponsored action does not necessarily mean that there's a direct causal relationship. However, the trend in the timing here is highly suggestive of a correlation that may be causative. And if nothing else, it disproves that recreational marijuana is some type of effective crime prevention measure. So here's one theory to explain the rise in crime. When a representative government makes marijuana quote unquote legal, it is not only making a statutory change, it is making a resounding cultural statement, specifically that marijuana is okay. Now the dirty secret of law enforcement is that most of its job is to respond to crime, not necessarily to ascertain or prevent it. Rather, law enforcement relies on citizens to be made aware of crimes being committed. In those states where marijuana is legal, there is now a permissive attitude towards marijuana because it is legal or okay or medicine. As such, residents are far less likely to call the police in response to observing cannabis plants growing in someone's backyard or on their farm, or people loading marijuana into the trunk of a car. This is precisely the type of environment drug traffickers and the cartels wish to operate in. When drug traffickers increase their presence in an area, violent crime invariably follows. Further, it turns out that recreational marijuana doesn't eliminate the illicit black market in the state, especially in view of the fact that state regulation and taxes forces prices higher for legal cannabis. 
The illegal market can readily persist because users aren't inclined to pay premium prices just to avoid committing low-level or non-existent possession offenses that the police are ignoring. The price being the primary selling point, the only legitimate way dealers can compete is by driving down the prices, which only makes illegal cannabis more attractive. The most damnable lie told by the cannabis advocates is that use would not increase after legalization. As we touched on, the entire logic of a business, its nature, its entire reason for existing is to make the most money it can. And when we're talking about an industry with the potential of earning billions of dollars, there will be incredibly smart people attempting to do just that. In the cannabis industry, the way to increase revenue is to increase the number of people using and the frequency of their use. Guess what? The cannabis industry is succeeding. Since legalization in Colorado, the rate of cannabis use among residents over the last year and over the last 30 days has increased. In the 18 to 25 year old demographic, use over the last 30 days increased by 50% such that one in three residents had recently used marijuana. In the age group of 25 and older, even though this would include the generations of people that had received and in many cases internalized an anti-cannabis ethos, use over the last 30 days doubled to 15%. In Colorado, nearly one in 10 people use cannabis every day. And as you can see, the numbers in terms of use in Washington are strikingly similar to Colorado. Remember, those using cannabis are not using it because it makes a nice pairing with the meal that they just prepared, because they like the taste of it or find it refreshing or because it protects against heart disease. They are using cannabis to get high. Now, while it's true that there is no clear evidence that the rate of use among youth is increasing in Colorado or Washington, keep a couple things in mind. First, cannabis use among Washington and Colorado teens was already among the highest in the country prior to recreational cannabis. Second, cannabis use disorder rates are 25% higher in youth in states that have legalized versus not legalized cannabis. And lastly, Remember, cannabis is still illegal to anyone under 21 in Colorado and Washington. As such, if it's true that youth rates have not increased in these states, it only proves my point that keeping cannabis illegal limits or reduces use, which is a good thing. And no, recreational cannabis will not result in reduced consumption of alcohol. Here are the gallons of liquor consumed in Colorado and Washington. As you can see, they're both going up over time since legalization. Along a similar vein, cannabis advocates have said that recreational cannabis may help alleviate the opioid epidemic. Some say that it's a safe substitute for opioids to treat pain. Well, the primary meta-analysis on whether cannabis effectively treats pain consists of a review of 28 studies and found only moderate quality evidence to support the use of cannabinoids for treatment of chronic pain with most trials showing improvement in symptoms associated with cannabinoids, but those associations did not reach statistical significance in all trials. Further, all of these studies compared cannabis with a placebo, not even a pain reliever like ibuprofen. As such, whether cannabis is a more effective treatment for pain than any number of other currently available pain relievers that have been determined to be safe is unknown. Look, cannabis treats pain the same way that alcohol treats pain, or nitrous oxide helps at a dentist's office. In the same way that it doesn't hurt as bad to stub your toe at a Christmas party after a few drinks, back pain doesn't throb as bad when you're high. As Dr. Back, a pulmonary physician at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York put it in the Wall Street Journal, if cannabis is medicine, so is Budweiser. The truth, unfortunately, is that recreational cannabis will likely increase opioid use. Everybody gets mad when you bring up the gateway drug hypothesis and always seem to launch into some kind of diatribe where Nancy Reagan is invoked in a sarcastic way. But these sarcastic responses playing up the ironies or the shortcomings of the don't do drugs campaign in the face of facts and studies don't make those facts or studies invalid. So have at it. Make your jokes. But here are a list of studies from the National Academy of Sciences meta-analyses and a few other sources that indicate that cannabis use not only increases the risk of using and abusing opioids, but also increases the risk of using and abusing tobacco and alcohol. One of the worst outcomes of recreational cannabis is the danger that it creates on the roadways. It is beyond dispute that cannabis significantly undermines a driver's ability to operate a car safely and impairs every performance area that can reasonably be connected with safe driving of a vehicle. 
such as tracking, motor coordination, visual functions, vigilance, perception of time and speed, and performance of divided attention tasks. To the surprise of no one, since recreational cannabis became legal in Colorado and Washington, fatal car crashes increased significantly in these states along with the percentage of drivers involved in these fatal crashes testing positive for cannabis. Now let's consider that phrase, tested positive for cannabis, not under the influence of cannabis. And the reason for this phrase is that determining whether or not someone is under the influence of cannabis is not so simple. In fact, it's not simple at all. The scariest part of this whole recreational cannabis experiment is that there is really no straightforward way to determine whether or not someone is, quote, under the influence of cannabis. Now, in Illinois, like all other states, driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs or a combination of alcohol and drugs is illegal. Basically, a person is said to be driving under the influence of a substance generally in one of two ways. First, if a person's mental or physical faculties are so impaired by the alcohol or drug ingested as to reduce his ability to think or act with ordinary care. In order to establish this, no chemical testing is required. Generally, this can be proved by a police officer's observations of a defendant. So for example, in a DUI case involving alcohol, an officer may testify to a defendant's poor driving and that he or she was swerving in the lane of traffic, bloodshot glassy eyes, slurred speech, strong odor of alcohol, failure of field sobriety tests. Second, a DUI can be proven through chemical testing or by evidence that the defendant had a concentration of an intoxicating substance such as alcohol or THC in his or her blood in an amount that exceeds a legal threshold. For alcohol, this threshold is 0.08 deciliters of alcohol per milliliter of blood or the well-known 0.08 standard. Prior to passing recreational cannabis, the Illinois legislature created a THC standard for cannabis of five nanograms of THC per milliliter of blood, now known as the five nanogram standard. Anything over five nanograms, you are legally considered to be under the influence of marijuana. While a blood alcohol concentration can be assessed with the breathalyzer machine that the suspect blows into, testing for blood THC concentration requires a police officer to obtain a direct blood sample. In order to get a blood sample, the officer needs a judge to sign a warrant and a phlebotomist, usually at a hospital, to draw the blood. But let's take a look at this five nanogram standard. There's really not a lot of scientific evidence to support that the five nanogram standard is a good way to differentiate between people that are under the influence of THC and others who are not. Well, let's start with the 0.08 standard for alcohol. This was developed after decades of robust and rigorous research establishing that blood alcohol concentration and impairment are proportionally related. Or in other words, as one goes up, so does the other, and that all drivers suffer significant deficits in their ability to operate a motor vehicle with ordinary care after their blood alcohol concentration reaches or exceeds 0.08. That's not the case with cannabis. THC is a big organic chemical compound and unlike alcohol is hydrophobic, which means that it does not dissolve and remain in the water in our blood. Think oil and water. Think like dissolves like. As such and unlike alcohol, it naturally leaves a person's blood quickly and migrates into other big organic chemicals in the body, most notably fat. Wouldn't you know it, the fattiest organ in the body is the brain, the very organ where THC has its effect. Because THC is hydrophobic, 90% of it is removed from a person's bloodstream within an hour of ingestion, which is a rate that far outpaces alcohol. THC levels in the blood then decrease gradually, and unlike alcohol, there is a high variability between people and their THC blood concentrations at different points of time, even when the same amount of THC is ingested. What all this means is that the THC concentration in a person's blood often says very little about how the THC a person has consumed is affecting their brain, their level of impairment, and their ability to drive a car. Simply because a person may have recently smoked cannabis and is under the influence does not mean his or her THC blood concentration will be five nanograms or more. In fact, the National Highway Transportation and Safety Administration, which is the federal body responsible for creating field sobriety tests and basically the authority on all things DUI, has formally stated that laws using THC concentrations in the blood as a measure of driving impairment appear to be, quote, based on something other than science, end quote. The United States Congressional Research Service, the guys responsible for educating Congress, stated that, quote, there is no reliable test to indicate impairment from marijuana, 
end quote. So let's consider a hypothetical. John Doe, high on cannabis after recently smoking, gets pulled over for driving 15 miles per hour below the speed limit. The officer observes Mr. Doe to have bloodshot eyes and a slower affect when speaking and interacting with the police officer. So the officer asks Mr. Doe to step out of the car and perform field sobriety tests, which he passes with flying colors because field sobriety tests were designed to detect people under the influence of alcohol, not cannabis. Now the officer asks Mr. Doe to submit to a breathalyzer test, which Mr. Doe does. Triple zeros, no alcohol in his system. Now the officer asks Mr. Doe to submit to a blood test. Mr. Doe refuses. The officer, in order to get Mr. Doe's blood, must go back to the police department with Mr. Doe, type up an affidavit detailing his encounter with Mr. Doe and a warrant, find a judge to review and sign the warrant, and after doing all of that, take Mr. Doe to the hospital to have his blood drawn. This process can take two hours or more. So now, by the time Mr. Doe is getting his blood drawn, it's been well over two hours since Mr. Doe was actually driving. How much cannabis is likely to be left in his system based on what we just said? Well, let's say it's less than five nanograms. So now the evidence against Mr. Doe is that he has, quote, cannabis in his system, which Mr. Doe's attorney points out is not unusual for a person who has smoked cannabis within the last 30 days. Mr. Doe has bloodshot eyes, which Mr. Doe's attorney attributes to Mr. Doe's allergies and sensitivities to some of the material Mr. Doe is exposed to as a construction worker and a slow manner of speech, which Mr. Doe's attorney indicates is just Mr. Doe's personality, and how can an officer who has never met Mr. Doe conclude that this is unusual? Does that strike you as proof beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Doe was driving under the influence of cannabis? Now let's suppose that Mr. Doe smokes cannabis, relaxes for an hour, and though still high and impaired, gets in his car to go and get a snack. On the way to the convenience store, he runs a stop sign, crashes and kills a family of six. Mr. Doe is brought to the hospital because he requires medical treatment too. As a result, the police now have to wait several hours before they can begin interviewing Mr. Doe and beginning their DUI investigation. Well, in an analogous alcohol DUI case, hospital blood tests drawn for the purposes of treatment would likely reveal that the driver who killed the family of six has a blood alcohol concentration of above a 0.08, but that's not necessarily the case with the THC as we discussed. So can you now see how it might be difficult to get justice for that family of six? In Washington, 40% of drivers who had used cannabis in the last year admitted to driving within three hours of marijuana use. In Colorado, 20% of the people that use cannabis within the last 30 days admitted to driving after using. And it's not just cannabis users that drive while under the influence or soon after using that are dangerous. A 2020 study conducted by the McLean Hospital in Boston found that sober drivers who are heavy cannabis users, in other words, had used five out of the last seven days, are significantly more dangerous drivers than non-users when tested on an advanced driving simulator. And of course, all the dangers, all the mental illness and health risks, all the death that we can expect to result from recreational cannabis can be monetized as a cost that we as individuals, communities, institutions, and the state will have to bear. Now here's one estimate of the cost of recreational marijuana, which as you can see exceeds the estimates of tax revenues we can expect. Remember, these estimates do not include a monetization of the human misery, the suffering, and the emotional anguish that certainly comes with mental illness, cannabis use disorder, and roadside death. There's no way to estimate that. So in the end, that's the question we have to ask with respect to recreational marijuana, which when you untangle it, from all the rhetoric and window dressing is all about the high and the good feelings cannabis produces for the consumer and the money it produces for the cannabis industry. And we're left to ask, is it worth it? Are those transient and short-lived good feelings worth it? Is the money worth it?